morning, church. Praises to our Heavenly Father. <coughs> Excuse me. Our scripture will be coming from Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. Would you stand for the reading of God's word if you're able? Again, Matthew 9. Verse 35 through 38. Gotta say, man. Don't gotta say. Hold on, Deke. All right. Whoo, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Mm. In such a way. Hmm. Been over a year since I've been standing. Praise God for keeping us. The scripture reads as follows. I'll be reading from the New King James Version as well. The title of this is The Compassion of Jesus. 35 reads, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, I say that again, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Wow. Verse 37. Then he said to the disciples, this is Jesus talking now, y'all. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest. I just read to you Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, and the word of God is already blessed. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Last March until this March, the world has experienced a lot of things. A pandemic, plagues, plague, earthquakes, floods, all kind of destruction. But our God is still in control. And I thank him beyond measures for taking good care of us in spite of. Shall we bow for a moment of prayer? Gracious God, who art in heaven, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we just come to you, just want to say thank you. So much has happened around us, to us, and through us. But, Lord, you were there every step of the way. You guided us. You sent your angels to watch over us day and night. And we just simply got to say thank you. Lord, you've been so good to each and every one of us. We just can't say thank you enough. But, Lord, we come here to praise your holy name because you are worthy to be praised. Lord, we thank you for the house of worship. So many have been away from this house, but we're trickling back in, thanks to you. We ask that you would continue to watch us, guide us, protect us, keep our, our, your arms of protection around us as we go through our daily lives. Now, Lord, as we get ready to hear the word from on high, we ask that you would continue to bless our pastor. We thank you for the teaching, even on Facebook, on Zoom, or whatever technology that was available, your word still went forth. We thank you for all that you have done for this congregation, all the congregation under the sound of, that's under your name, under your umbrella. Lord, we thank you for Sister Malone. She continues to teach. Your word is not gone void. We thank you for their tenacity, that where they can just, they're easy to talk to. They're easy to understand. We thank you for the choir that's, that's singing from on high this morning. 
Lord, we just want to give you praise, total praise, because you're worthy to be praised. We thank you for all those that just couldn't make it in today, but they're listening on Facebook or whatever technology that they're listening to. We ask that you would bless and continue to watch over them. Now, Lord, we ask a special blessing over those that are in bereavement. Bless the families. There's so many people that are hungry. We ask that you would, if you can feed 5,000 with bread, with two loaves of bread and five fish, I know you can take care of this country. There's no doubt in my mind. Lord, we just thank you. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now we'll turn it over to Sister Malone. tragedy of the age. Not that men are poor. All men know something of poverty. Not that men are wicked. Who is good? Not that men are ignorant. What is truth? Nay, but that men know so little of men. W. E.B. Du Bois. The 1890 census showed 143 Negroes living in Rockford. And the following year, the first colored church was organized to the great delight of Peter Blakely. Brought up in a Methodist home, during his childhood years in South Carolina, Blakely had long hoped to launch a congregation of this faith for Rockford Negroes. His efforts of many years were rewarded in September of 1891 when Allen Chapel AME Church was organized in the second floor home of his mother-in-law, Marie Dunley, at 212 South Main Street. Present at the meeting, Blakely, Mary Eldridge, Fanny Hawkins, Harry Thompson, and Boley Willock, the Reverend S.B. Jones was called to be the first pastor with J.C. Anderson, R. Taylor, George Dixon, and S. McDowell, following in the pulpit before the turn of the century. Members met in a stone building on the southeast corner of South Winnebago and Elm Streets, the site on which they would eventually build a new church. In May of 1917, Rockford's second church for Negroes was organized as Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. It began with a Sunday school and prayer meeting developed by Grant Madison, Lewis Branch, Walter Brooks, and a Mr. Banks, Reverend J.C. China, who elected Sunday school superintendent. Others of the Baptist faith joined the group, and on August 6th, under the direction of Reverend Adam Madison, a full church was organized. Services were held at 812 West Street, the home of Grant Madison. Lewis Branch suggested the name Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. Charter members also included a Reverend Holden, Thomas P. McGee, Thomas Cochran, a Mr. Cook, Mrs. M. A. Madison, Sarah Branch, Lillian Gaza, Martha Rook, Mary Dublin, Delia Cochran, Rachel Jackson Flood, a Mrs. S. Smith, and a Mrs. Johnson. In October, charter member Thomas P. McGee was chosen to be the church's 
first pastor, and he was ordained serving Pilgrim for the next eight months. During that time, property was purchased at 846 Montague Street. The congregation was enlarged in the persons of David H. and Mary um, Corzine Gilbert, Ed and Annie Anderson, Mary Jane Poole, T.J. White, Reverend Sam Jackson, Dan and Pearl Roden, and Mr. and Mrs. Carl Madison. Jesse A. Walden, a Camp Grant chaplain, succeeded Reverend Thomas P. McGee as pastor of Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church, but served only a few minutes before he resigned to organize Bethel Baptist Church. The third Negro church, originally known as First Colored Baptist Church of Rockford, was formed in the early spring of 1918 as a mission with services being held in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Tammy Turner at 412 Peoples Avenue. After a few months, the Forbes boarding home at 300 Peoples Avenue was secured for church services. Then Sister Rosa organized a church club known as the Willing Worker which raised $25 for the first payment on property located at 724 Harrison Avenue. Pastors of three white Baptist churches in Rockford wishing to see the Negro church properly established wrote to the home mission board of the Baptist church in New York City and borrowed $500 to purchase the Harrison Avenue property. Reverend L. K. Williams, president of the Illinois State Baptist Convention, sent a delegation to legally organize the church. Since there was already a First Baptist Church in Rockford, the name of the new Negro Church was changed to Bethel Baptist Church. Camp Grant Talent assisted the Allen Chapel Choir in a musical concert at the church on Wednesday evening, April 10th, 1918. Fanny Robinson directed the group and a lovely picture of her adorned the program. The singers were Fanny, Ethel Blake, Louise Tucker, and Alice Holt, sopranos, Desiree uh, Blakely, Bertha Caldwell, Ella Harris, and Florence Blakely, contraltos, tenors, Edmund, John Wells and Jesse Robinson, and bassist Frank Ingram and Edward Robinson. God bless you. How many know we serve a good God? He's a great God, he and he's worthy to be praised. Here we go, come on.
are good and your mercy endureth forever.
people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you.
may love God on today. Yes, 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 Lord. Thank you. There is no one like him. I've searched high and I've looked low. But no one compares to God. He is our provider. Yes. He's been our protector. Yes. He's been our healer. Yes. Thank you. He is Thank our deliverer. You. Yes. He is the great I am. Yes, he is. He is the way. There is no other way. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. That's right. Nobody. Thank you.
just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. More than anything. Yes. 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 You've been mighty good. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. How many of you can really say, I love you, Jesus, and I love you more than anything? I have that beautiful wife sitting here I've been with 48 years we've been together, been married over 46, and I love her, but I love Jesus more than anything because of what he done for us he didn't just do it for me but he did it for us amen praise God we thank God for such a beautiful day it is what a great day to be a worshiper of a true and a living God. Amen. What a great day to be a worshiper. How many of you glad you're saved? I'm showing sure up glad I'm saved. Amen. He, he saved me. Amen. And I'm glad about it. Amen. And I hope, I hope and pray a lot of more folks get saved. And I ain't talking about just getting acquainted. I'm talking about getting to know him. Get to know him in such a way that you want everybody to know him. Amen. We're grateful again for being here and thank God for all of the saints that showed up this morning here and to all the saints that are watching us by Facebook and be YouTube. We thank God for you as well, amen, and all of the different states that we, uh, we've been uh, blessed to have our broadcast, and even in Antigua, and uh, our members in Antigua got family members watching, and uh, we got members in Italy who's serving in the military, and we, they're watching. We thank God for them as well, amen. So we thank God for all of you. And, and most of all, I thank God that he made uh, an opportunity for us to be able to worship him. Uh, even though uh, we couldn't, this, this month, the third Sunday of this month will be a year since we had a full worship service in this building. Amen. But God made a way for us to still get his word. He did not take the word from us. He, he allowed us to still be able to get the word forth. God is a good God, isn't he? He fed us still spiritually so that we could stay close to him. I want to I wanna, I wanna talk about the mission of the master. The mission of the master. In the book of, of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse number 35. Uh, Matthew, uh, chapter 9, beginning at verse number 35, and say, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But, but, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep 
having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Amen. The mission of the master. Really, the mission of the master is threefold. Uh, his first mission uh, of Jesus was to minister. He was to minister. And four things that about his ministry, he said that, first of all, look at his method of ministry. Jesus had but one method in reaching people. And that is he went out. He went out after the people. He did not sit back and wait for the people to come to him. Notice what Luke uh, 19 and 10 says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. We are foolish if we just sit back and wait on people to come. Because the, ma the vast majority of the people are not coming. They do not know how to come. They don't know where to come. We have to go after them. That same method that Jesus used he left when he got before he left. Remember what he said in Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore. And teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I. I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. That was Jesus' method. He said, go. This is why I teach you all to, as you go, talk to somebody. My wife and I took our little ride on Friday, as we always do, and we stopped. We went to up in uh, Moline, and, and I was in the store shopping, and uh, I asked this young man who was working in the store, did he uh, know, know who I was wearing a cart? So he said, I'll get you one. He was very kind, went and got me a cart and brought it back. And I had to ask him, I said, you know any preachers in this area? What church you go to? As you go, and, and, and I found out that he was not really churched, but his mother was. And uh, his mother, I preached for the church that his mother's a member of. That's why I was asking. I know most of the preachers in that area. And he, he, he I said, now what church you? He said, well, my mother. See, this is how you get to know whether people are saved or not. They gonna tell you if mama or grandmama and them go to church. But if you don't ask, as you go. That's the method. The method is as you go. You find somebody as you go. You see somebody as you go and you talk to them as you go. That was Jesus' method. Jesus, Jesus went everywhere. Then secondly, his place of ministry. Jesus literally went everywhere. In all the cities, in the villages, in the, in the, in the countryside, in the synagogues, on the mountain, by the seashore, in boats, by graveyards, in homes. There was no place that Jesus did not go to minister. Listen, 
we need to learn something from him. If Jesus went everywhere, how much more should we not neglect the mission field? You know, most of us don't mind going to projects and things like that because we want to go there to witness the folks. But what about the one in the mansion? We don't go to the mansions. We don't want to go to it. We're always headed to the slums. As the ones in the mansion don't need no Jesus. Matter of fact, they might need Jesus a little bit more. He went everywhere. He taught in the synagogues, in the existing establishments. See, because we see folks in church, we don't think they need no witnesses. But he went to the ones that was established. He made use of whatever was available, whoever he could talk to. He went where he went. He went where there was uh, already an audience in place. See, when you get in a place, sometimes you're sitting around with a bunch of folks. You need to bring up Jesus. <laughs> you, 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 you need to you need to you need to sneak him in. <laughs> they don't invite him in, so you need to sneak him in. There are places where some of us won't go. There, there are some preachers won't go to small towns. Way uh, by places that are out of the way. They don't go there. Now, everybody's not authorized to go to foreign countries. But we need to, everywhere we go, we need to be letting Jesus be known. Jesus' work. So we know we go everywhere, but his work also was teaching, preaching, and healing. He had a threefold work that he served while he was here. He preached. That's the proclamation of the good news of the kingdom. We need to tell them about God. That's what we need to be doing. He brought that message of salvation and redemption to man. And not only did he preach, but he taught. He rooted and grounded all who would receive the message. Hearing and receiving the good news were not enough for the people. They needed to be taught. That's the problem today. I just believe that that's the biggest problem we face today. They done heard the proclamation, but have they been taught? He healed them physically, mentally, and emotionally. Now, we, we don't have that healing, uh, physical healing, but in the church, we ought to be able to heal people mentally and emotionally. Because most of their mental problem is because they don't have no Jesus. We need to be giving them some Jesus. Thank God for our spiritual guidance ministry who helps people to get through these mental and emotional problems that they have. That's part of our ministry. Listen, what is preaching? And, and teaching. Preaching is talking, and, 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 but preaching is just not enough by itself. What God has, want us to do is once they get, get we preach to them, then we got to teach them. You got to teach them. Every believer is to be a proclaimer. See, a lot of folks want to be in the pulpit preaching. But if they're not in the pulpit, they don't think they ought to be preaching. But let me tell you something. Everybody that's been born again, you ought to be preaching. Now, yes, Jesus got some he set aside for the vocation, but every believer 
should be preaching and, and teaching people about Jesus, you ought to be able to do that. Men need to hear the message. But they also need to be taught how to live once they get the message. That's the problem. They got to learn how to apply it to their lives. The only conceivable way men can know how to live day by day is to be taught the details of the message. What good is the message that make you shout in the church and then you go home and you live raggedy? The old, folk, old preacher used to say, it's not how high you shout. It's how straight you walk when you come down off your shout. Got to be taught the message. When dealing with the preaching and the teaching and the healing, there, there's a danger that you got to guard against. Because preaching only will feed only the major points of God's message to the people. Preaching only will have a person with a huge gap in their spiritual lives. Do you see that today? People got a spiritual gap. They've been preached till they go to church every Sunday. But they got a gap in their spiritual lives. He got to know how to apply what he gets on Sunday day by day. Teaching is needed to help them do that. But teaching only is an error, too. Two things you need to know about that. It only leads a person into a discussion of God's word and give them the details. But it misses out on the proclamation of the overview and the great subjects of the Bible. Teaching only shortchanges a person in the experience of worshiping around the proclamation of the king's message. Teaching only is shortchanging a person in the experience of the Holy Spirit working through the preaching. When you get to preaching, you get feeling good. And that makes folks around you feel good. You don't get that in teaching. You know. They said, what is, what is a lecture? Somebody said, ask one by, so what is a lecture? He said, a lecture is preaching toned down. <laughs> and preaching is a lecture toned up. <laughs> so you got to get that, get that spirit in there. Teaching just minimizes God's cho chosen method to save men. It often leads a person to feel that he's growing into or becoming a Christian because he learned some details of the word. But preaching helps him to get the understanding of that word. Then Jesus was healing. But you know what? One of the biggest problems we face today, people want to come and get healed, but they don't want to get whole. Y'all remember that, don't you? In the Bible, uh, 10 of them came by. They needed to be healed. And when he healed all 10 of them, uh, then but one get whole. Only one came back that said, thank you for delivering me. Thank you. See, you, 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 a whole lot of folks want to get healed, but they don't want to get whole. Jesus' method, Jesus' place, and the work. But also, you got to know his message. The gospel of the kingdom. Jesus was the herald of the king's proclamation of the good news of the king. You know, we, we, we preaching too much other stuff. Paul said, I come to you knowing nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all people need to know to get saved. Jesus Christ and him crucified. You got a kingdom, so there's a king. And the kingdom need to be preached. 
because that's where the king dwells. They need to know the king. So you got to know the truth. We are heralds of the truth. We, we got to be speaking the truth. Jesus is the herald who is the perfect representative of the king who preached nothing but the truth. He proclaimed that good news about the kingdom, the message without any falsehood, full of truth, hope, and hope for the eternal salvation. That's what Jesus taught. That was his word, and that's our word. People are wondering how through this uh, plague that we got up on the, on the world. A whole year? Now, we ain't never been out of church a year. We never had to stay out of church a whole year because of a plague. People need to know. This is God's work. See, when people know God and understand God and know the work of God, they can understand why we're in this. We got to change our ways. <laughs> got to get the sin out. Got to get sin out. When, there, when if we get people saved and people stop sinning, then God can lift the plague. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my faith, turn from their wicked way. Then he said, when do you want me to hear, Lord? He said, he said, then, after you do these four things that I put out there, then I'll hear you. People are praying, but God's not hearing. <laughs> because we have not repented. We're not seeking his face. We're not turning from our wicked ways. Mean to get that way. Secondly, 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 uh, Jesus Christ's compassion. The mission of Jesus was to show compassion. He was expected to demonstrate God's compassion, God's kindness of compassion to all men, no matter who they were. It said Jesus saw the multitude. He saw those following him, those in the villages, in the cities, in the countryside, the synagogue, on the mountain, by the seashore, in the graveyard, riding in the boats, in the home. He saw them and he was moved with compassion. Didn't matter where they were, who they were, he saw what they needed. And he was moved with compassion. was moved over their physical needs of men, their hunger, their pain, their suffering. He was moved over their spiritual needs, their being lost and dead to God, their emptiness, their loneliness, their bewilderment. We see that every day. Are we moved with compassion? He saw them having no purpose, no meaning, no significance in life. How many people you see wandering around aimlessly, don't know where they're going, don't know what they're looking for? He saw that no one escaped the eyes and the heart of Jesus. He looked and he saw. And what did he see? He saw the crowd faint. They were weighted down and ready to collapse. Life weighted them down. How many of you know people that every day wife, life just weighted them down? They, they don't even want to leave. Life weights them down. Life is cruel. Life is hard. Life is impoverishment. Life is empty. Life is without purpose if you don't have Jesus. You feel hopeless and you feel worthless. Life weighted them down. Religion. Religion weighted them down. Yeah, religion weighted them down. 
Religion lays heavy burdens on people. Demands after everything upon them. It requires endless rituals, ceremonies, and rules. That's religion. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking about religion. Religion weighted them down. Religion also misled them into beliefs that really did not lead them to God. How many following religion today don't have no God? They just following religion. They are not spiritually satisfied because they are following religion. They are dead to God because they are following religion. Sin weighted them down. They were not taught the truth, but rather the idea of the religious. Therefore, they, was, they were still dead in sin. Look at it today. People are, 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 are telling people it's okay to live against what God said. That's sin. They're weighted down with sin. People, people trying to figure out why things don't change, why things like they are. They're weighted down with sin. You don't get rid of your sins until you confess them. You can't, you can't uh, pass this stuff over. They, I, they, got, they got stuff now. They got drugs that say you can live a homosexual lifestyle and you can take this pill and you won't pass it. You tell me. That's, that's sin. People are weighted down with sin. You got to, you got to confess your sins. You can't legalize marijuana and folks be intoxicated all the time and think that they okay. That's sin. Weighted down with sin. Weight of sin rests upon their hearts and preys upon their minds. Weaken them whenever, and weaken them from the confidence or the assurance that they could have. Nervous and trying to figure out why. Hey, hey, hey. You, you listen, you can have confidence in Jesus Christ if you know Him. This religion don't get to know Jesus as a Savior. Sin got them uncertain of their future. I don't know what's going to happen. I know where I'm going when I leave here. I don't have no doubts about my future home. They weighted down with life. They weighted down with religion. They weighted down with sin. Jesus said a crowd fainted, for they were deceived by their leaders. They were deceived by the teachers. They were deceived by those preachers and those priests of that day. They had great confidence in their leaders and their teachers. Their leaders misled them and deceived them, and therefore they followed and lived in error. A road that leads to emptiness. They were empty. They were weary. They were perplexed. They were unsatisfied. That's what's wrong today. All, a lot of these churches are not preaching Jesus and repentance and being and, 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 and changing your ways. They're saying you can live the way you live and be happy and satisfied. There's no satisfaction outside of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. I got a lot to preach this morning. I'm going to preach it all. <laughs> Jesus, he had a mission. He saw the crowd scatter. They wandered about, not knowing which direction to go. Don't you see that in the world today? People are wandering all over the place. They don't know where to go. They stopped here and there trying to find something that's satisfied to no avail. 
they pull up to the place called the sunshine or whatever it is. In the cold, in the rain, in the snow. Crowds of an hour was wrapped around the place trying to get in to get them some satisfaction. But I think that was Otis Redding that said, I can't get no satisfaction. You ain't getting no satisfaction out of none of that stuff until you get Jesus Christ in your life. There's no satisfaction. Preacher, how do you know? Because I used to smoke the mess. I didn't get no satisfaction until I got my mind clear. Realized that everything I needed was already in Jesus Christ. He saw the crowd. They were scattered. Trying to find some satisfaction. They were without meaning. They were without purpose. They had no significance. So many turned to that restricted religion called Judaism. Or the philosophy of the Stoics of that day. Listen to philosophy. They had loose religion like the uh, polytheism. They had more than one God. They turned to the religion when they didn't want no religion. They just turned to atheism. And then now they done turned to what is called humanism. You don't need nobody else. You got everything within yourself. That's what that humanism tells. That's why they are lost. Nothing feel their inner being. Nothing really satisfied, not spiritually. The human soul still ache for the truth of God. And let me tell you something. I almost brought them little, I, I, I bought my little grandbabies when they come over. I got, the, they like puzzles. And I bought this one little puzzle thing that got all the different shapes. And, and Brielle, the first thing she get when she come to church, come to the house, is she run and get that out and dump them out. And she did, she started putting them back in. She'll hold one up. And let me know. I know where this go. <laughs> and she'll put it in the right spot. And that's what's wrong with the world. They have not put Jesus in the right spot. That's why they're searching for everything else. They're trying to fill that one spot that only Jesus can feel. Jesus saw the crowd as sheep without a shepherd. They went astray just as sheep do. They had no leader who had the courage to surrender to the truth and to live by it. Uh-oh. Sound like some of that stuff today, don't it? Some of these leaders don't know that don't want to live by the truth. There was no one to teach the truth. Practically every teacher seemed to be out to fleece the sheep. To secure their own position and build a following of their own ideas. Few led the people to God. Matter of fact, many led people away from God. The people were like sheep, he said, without a shepherd. Jesus saw that. Then thirdly, the mission of Christ was to share the vision of a world in desperate need. The vision that the Lord Jesus is, is uh, getting, is that, that the man to get to know God, the challenge was for him was to get man to know him. The vision of the great harvest, he said, all men, everywhere were faint. They were weary. They were bewildered. They were scattered as sheep without a shepherd. But every human life in the whole globe needed to know that. And what did he say? 
the harvest is needful. It's great. It's plenteous. There are fields and fields of people growing in valleys and in the hills and in the world. It's ripe for the harvest, ready to, to be harvest. It has no reapers. <laughs> it needs somebody to reap them. And you got to reap it in its season. But when is the season? The season is our generation now. We got to do it during this generation, during the time that we're here. We can't go back what mom and them used to do and granddad and them. You know, too many people are going back talking about my granddad and my grandmama. You, they, you, they can't, this is our generation. We're living in a time when things are different than it was back in the day. And we need to be harvesting it. Every generation has to reap in its own generation. Every generation got to reap in its own generation. Everyone has a certain season when the, where we can reap. And this season is, is, is short. Ain't no long season. There's a peak season. Listen, this is the peak season. God done demonstrated what he can do. God done demonstrated he can shut down the world whenever he, he didn't just shut down no country. God shut down the whole world. He could have demonstrated that he can shut down. This is the peak season for harvest. Harvest is plentiful. A harvest of children need to be reached and taught. You, you see some of these little children, they put them on Facebook talking and, and, and doing this kind of stuff. Little babies. <laughs> teaching them how to talk instead of teaching them how to know Jesus. Children, there's a harvest out here for the children. There's a harvest for young people. They need to be reached so they can be grounded in the word. You know what the biggest problem is? Those young people are not grounded in the word. If they had been grounded in the word, they'd have taught their children, baby, what you doing? Like my wife would have slapped them on there and said, what you, don't you never let me see you doing nothing like that again. That's what they would have said. They wouldn't have been there clapping them, putting them on Facebook and, and, and going. No, no. Young people need to be taught and grounded in the Word so they can help their children get grounded. There's a harvest of well, women that need to be reached and taught confidence and protection of God's love. A lot of women, too much abuse going on. Abusive men out here abusing the women, and the women don't have no confidence. Don't feel like they got no protection. Don't feel like they got no love, but God loves you if nobody else. They need to be taught. There's a harvest for men. They need to be reached and taught the strength and the security of God's direction and God's care. They need to get away from going in their own direction. They need to be taught how to follow God. Men been following their own self too long. Me, myself, and I've been going too long. We got to learn how to follow God's direction. Men need to be taught to follow God's direction. There's a world of opportunity out to, in, in the harvest now. There are fields and fields, local fields and national fields and classes of people out here, professionals and non-professionals, people in health care, people in got abilities, they got all kind of uh, things going on in their lives, emotional and mental problems, but they still need to be harvested. They're lost. They're spiritually sick. 
They are unreached. And there's no end to the field of the harvest. I, I, I didn't even realize. We had 74 million people voted for the loser. In this country, that wasn't all. Everybody didn't vote. 74 million people voted for the loser. 81 million people voted for the winner. And that's not everybody in this country. The harvest is plentiful. Then there was the vision for, of a great need for laborers. Jesus saw it all, didn't he? He saw a need for laborers. He need people. He need believers. I mean real believers. I'm not talking about phony folks. The devil got a lot of phony folks out here that's messing up the world. That's messing up people. But Jesus needs some real believers. He need men, women, boys, and girls who believe in him and know him. He, the laborers are few. He need many laborers, and, and he, they need them now. Unless they are reapers to go forth. For the harvest will die and rot on the vine. There's an unlimited amount of work to be done. But there are so few to do it. The harvest will never be reaped unless the labors go for it. God ain't coming back and do it himself. He left it in our hands. That's why he saved you. He didn't save you for you to, to shout and jump and do all that by yourself. He saved you so you can help save somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I don't, I don't, I, and I don't think God mind you jumping and shouting and in, enjoying him, but he wants you to do that so others can see what you got. And they all want some of what you got. harvest will rot unless somebody go out and get it. The laborers are desperately needed in every generation. The harvest is always great. There's not a time in the world when, the, when we don't need to be getting after these men, women, boys, and girls. The harvest must have enough reapers so that we can get it done in our own season. Just look at the whole world. And don't you know the world changes about every hundred years? Every hundred years, the people, the world, the world changes because people don't live to be no more than a hundred years old. And then the whole world is changed and their need for some more labels. Why? Are there are no more labels. Why? Why? Why don't we have these labels? Well, some reject the call of God. The world is more appealing. And God called, but we don't want to answer. Then some postponed the call of God. If you had went when he called you, how many more could you have saved? We postponed the call. Some even deny the call of God. They close their minds entirely. Not me. He's not talking to me. Some go seeking other professions and, and other positions and, and, and other livelihoods that they want to have for themselves and not hear the call. Some preach false gospel. They seek uh, to get their own and their own ideas instead of the truths of God out. Some just lack enough commitment to reach out and minister. Some are satisfied with the traditional ritual and approaches of religion. And some folks go to church just do the same thing. 
Say it in the same place. Say the same thing. Then get up and go home. All week long, do the same thing. Don't talk to nobody. Don't try to convince nobody. Just satisfy with the traditional approach to religion. Some are more concerned with the bureaucracy than with laboring. More concerned with carrying things on as they always have been. vision of a great need he said for prayer need the laborers but the, the saints gotta pray laborers are needed but we must do the praying we must ask God to send laborers for the hearts it's totally inadequate for us humans to try to bring laborers and send them in, our hum, in their human strength that don't work. God calls and God appoints. And, 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 and when God does that, he sends forth them with power. We got to pray that God will raise up enough laborers to reach your generation. You know what's wrong right now? Biggest thing that's wrong right now, we got the wrong people that's witnessing. They're witnessing this human mess and the human strength and, and, and using what humans use. But they, you got to witness in the power of God. We need to pray. Christ prayed before he chose his disciples. Prayed all night long. The number of labors for any generation depend upon the prayer of the people of God. If my people. See, we don't do enough praying. We don't ask. You know, one of the things I think I see is that people feel like if they bring laborers in, somebody's going to take my place. Don't want to bring people in because you're afraid they're going to take your place. But I heard Dr. Donna Parsons say one time, he said, we all are working under the shadow of replacement. And what you need to do is be training somebody to take your place. That's how you keep laborers in the vineyard. You got to train them, pray. Lord, send the harvest. And when they come, don't run them away. People run the laborers out of the vineyard. Folks come in with an enthusiastic about working in the church, and then there's somebody over there talking about, you just got here. You ain't supposed to be doing all of that. You just got here. You don't run folks off when the God send laborers. Christ first of all, give his charge to his apostles and his ministers. They are to take the lead and teach the absolute necessary truth about him. Praying for laborers to come. The harvest is the Lord's harvest. And he knows the harvest. He knows every stem and every blade. He knows everyone. He knows everybody's mind. He knows their acts. He knows their thoughts. He knows the need of their provision. He knows everything about them. And when he send you, he's going to have them ready to receive you. He knows their hearts. So the laborers must be chosen, must be called, enlisted by Christ. Christ is the one who must send forth the laborers. I'm going to say this. I might get in trouble with somebody, but I don't care. Too many people done sent folks. You sound like a preacher. You look like a preacher. The devil can sound like a preacher. The devil can look like a preacher. That's why the Bible says that if it was at all possible, he would fool the very elect himself. 
Let God call the preachers. Let Christ call the preachers. Let's stop calling them ourselves. It's his harvest. So the laborers must be chosen by him, must be called by him, must be enlisted by him. Three things should drive us to pray for these laborers. The good news, the gospel of the kingdom ought to cause us to want to pray for laborers. The compassion that we have for men and women who are lost, those who are faint and scattered as sheep without a shepherd, that ought to make us want to pray, Lord, send us some help. Our love for Christ and appreciation for what he has done for us ought to want to see him do something for somebody else. Then the vision of a great force of laborers. The harvest is so plenteous and ready that a great force needs to be sent forth to harvest. God is the Lord of the harvest and we are the laborers. And one writer said we are laborers together with God. Isn't it great to be able to say that you work with God? You know, we boast about somebody that we think that's famous or some, somebody that got to taste, got to be pretty good, and they know that, you know, if, even if they just got in the paper, just got on the news for something, you holler, you know, I work with them. But I, I want to tell people I work with God. I'm a laborer together with God. Working side by side with God. Isn't that something? You can say that I work side by side with God to help bring laborers into the vineyard so we can get people saved. Some lessons we need to learn. God desires every generation to have a great force of labor. Let me say this. There are no unemployment in the kingdom. There are no lack of jobs in the kingdom. The laborers are few. But there are plenty of jobs. People out here hollering, I'm trying to find a job. Get in the church. <laughs> you join the kingdom of God. And, and who knows, God might put you in a church where you can have a job inside the church, working in the church. You don't know where God going to place you if you get saved. <laughs> it's God who is sending forth the laborers into the vineyard, not men. He do all of the selecting, all the calling, all the ordaining, and all of the sending. It's God's business. Our task is to pray for them to come. And when God raises them up, we are to support them and then utilize them in the work. Stop running them out of the church. God might send some gifted people in here, some that's more gifted than any of us. But we shouldn't run them out because they're gifted. The gift is needed. God sends it. God raises up people with every special gift for the field. I remember when Rodney came here the first Sunday that he worked with the choir. When we went home, my father-in-law asked me, can one man make that much difference? That's what he said. Can one man make that much difference? If you're gifted in an area and you let God use you, you can make a difference wherever God places you. He puts you in the vineyard to labor.
This is God's harvest, not ours. It's to be harvest, as he said, harvest. The harvest of God. You can reap the harvest, but there are some conditions that exist. First of all, if there's enough concern within our generation for the multitude of the people who are lost, oh, do we have that kind of attitude for these lost folks? If there's enough prayer for laborers, if there's enough commitment to surrender to his will and his call to go, if there's enough dedication to follow him day by day, hour by hour, not just on Sunday. Some folks don't put on Jesus until they put on their suit or their dress for Sunday. You got to do this day by day, hour by hour. I told y'all, we was up there. I run into this young man. I wanted to know. I, I wasn't asking him about the preachers. I was really getting to working my way around to ask him, which one is your pastor? What church do you go to? Is there enough faith to believe Christ and the truth of the scripture? Do you believe it? You can't tell nobody else about it if you don't believe it. Is there enough conviction to stand true and firm like Jesus did? Jesus knew what he was doing. He looked out and had compassion on those people who were scattered. to the end of his mission. He said, this mess, not mess, but this, this is a side order. <laughs> all of the healing, in it, all of the teaching, in it, all of the stuff that I've been doing wasn't nothing but a side order. I'm going to complete my mission now. Take me. Nail my hand. Nail my feet. That's my mission. Put me on a cross. That's my mission. Put me in that tomb. That's my mission. Because I got to show y'all that, that that grave can't hold me down. That's my mission. Is to show you that although you die, if in the Lord you can get up. Yeah, that's why he died. But he didn't stay dead. At the appointed time on that third day morning, he got up out the grave with all power, heaven and earth in his hand. And when he demonstrated to us how to do it, then he went on back to glory. Sat down at the right hand of the Father. And every time you go out there and go like he told you to go, he's rooting for you. Thank God for the mission of the Savior. But we got a mission too. He said, go ye. Therefore, don't just pick who you're going to witness to. I didn't know nothing about that young man. I didn't know nothing. Didn't know him. I just didn't. Matter of fact, I didn't even ask his name until later on. I run into him again in the store. He worked there. I run into him again. I said, I forgot to ask you your name. But I got to witness to him about churches. He said, I don't even know what church my mama go. He called his mama. And she told him what church her, her church was. When he, I said, now, what church you go to? He said, well, I, I, I go with my mama when I go. Well, I said, when we get back, make sure you go. 
to. You got to as you go. Witness as you go. They might reject you, but they rejected Jesus. If they get angry with you, don't worry about it. They got angry with Jesus. But as you go. That's your mission, as you go. That's our mission, as you go. Lord, we thank you for your mission. Thank you for commissioning us to go. We need your strength now. Father, we need laborers in this vineyard. We can't do it by ourselves. We need your help. Send us laborers for this harvest so we can reap it before it rot on the vine. Help us, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I had to preach it all. I couldn't, couldn't leave none on the vine this morning. Because the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into his harvest. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Anybody in here that don't know Jesus? Let me see your hand. Anybody in here? Anybody in here that don't know Jesus? Is it anybody in here? that don't know Jesus. Amen. Look like everybody in here knows Jesus. If there's anybody out there that's listening to us today that don't know Jesus, if you out there and you don't know Jesus, listen here. We are, we are, we are putting forth an effort today to harvest you and bring you into the vineyard before, the, before your season of, is over. And you don't be able to come in. You if you out there, if you listening to us, you never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can do that you right now. All you have to say is, Lord, I'm sorry. I was, I've, been, I've been in sin too long. I want to get out of this sinful life. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I want him to come into my life. I want him to, to live in me. If you can There's say that and pray that prayer, God will save you right you now. Jesus. He will save you. If you got away from God, you can come back to God today. right now. All you got to do is say, Lord, Nobody I'm sorry for turning my back on you. I'm coming back to you. you I want you to receive me back into your kingdom. And he'll Get receive you back right now. That's all you have to do. Amen. Right now, Amen. God bless. Today, God keep you. Heaven smile now. upon you and give you peace. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. I guess it's time to give. Come Amen. Come on, come on, come on. Let's do it like this. Right now. Those that are in the sanctuary, get your tithes and offering ready. Those that are going to give by give or five, St. Luke Baptist Church, Rockford, Illinois, go to give or five. I'm going to ask you in the sanctuary if you will put it in the basket when you go out. Amen. Will you put it in the basket when you go out? There's a basket at each door, so when you go out, let's put our tithes and offering in the basket when we go out. And we're going to do communion in a minute. Now, the Give of Fire, St. Luke Baptist Church. And I want to thank you all for you've been supporting the church through Give of Fire tremendously. I forgot, you know, uh, last year in 2020, which was the year of, everybody said it was a terrible year. But I want to say for you, St. Luke, it wasn't a terrible year. You, Amen. It was not a terrible year. 
you, you supported your church, you supported your pastor, you supported the ministries here. And I thank you for that. I really do. I appreciate that from the depths of my heart. Amen. The deacon going to pass the basket. If you, got, if you got it, you can drop it in the basket. Amen. I want to thank God for you. Amen. And uh, we did not, I want to thank God, we did not lose one member to the virus. Amen. We did not lose one member to the virus. Some had it, but we didn't lose them. Amen. We praise God for that. Amen. Praise God. I was, I was praying and asking God to keep our members. We had some to go in the hospital, but they out. Amen. Thank God. We're praying for the rest. If you want to give by cash app, dollar sign, the Luke, T-H-E-L-U-K-E, the Luke, amen, that's, you can give by cash out. The deacons are going to be here today from uh, 11 to 1, I'm probably going to see, yeah, they'll be here from 11 to 1, it, am I right? Yeah, it's right now. <laughs> they are here now. <laughs> and they'll be here to 1 o'clock to receive your tithes and offering. Amen. They'll be here to 1 o'clock to receive your tithes and offering. Amen. Then you can mail it in as well. You know how to do that. Uh, mail it in to the uh, St. Luke Baptist Church, 2919 19th Street, Rockford, Illinois. Cash out the loop 2919. The loop 2919. Amen. We're going to commune. Amen. We're going to commune. And I know a lot of you have already got your, your communion at home. And uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it here in the sanctuary. Probably the best way is to have each person to come by and uh, pick up their own. Amen. Let's let's begin over here. You, yeah, come on, come on around, pick up your communion, and then you go back to your seat. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Amen. Let's come on. Amen. Grab one and and uh, just. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Start from. Come on. From the rear. Come on. Do this corner. Oh, mother, mother already got hers. Amen. So let's come get. We want to maintain our distance, our social distance. That's what I'm trying to. That's why I'm doing this. I'm trying to maintain social distance. Amen. I want to thank the brethren, uh, sister, brother Willie and sister Hazel, and uh, those that came out and marked the church off for us. Sister, uh, Mark, uh, amen. Uh, uh, Rianne came out and, and uh, she works for the OSHA, and so she came out yesterday and helped us get this thing in order so we are making sure that we are safe and we want you to be safe, amen? Those that are in the sanctuary, when you come in, we want to make sure that you are safe, amen? Amen, so we maintain our social distancing, amen? Y'all serve, serve Reverend Williams next day. 
You got him already? Okay. Praise the Lord. Our choir members, amen. Thank you all so much. Y'all enhance our service, amen. want well, to thank all of you. Our choir members and our musicians, amen. Our, our minister of music, amen. Thank God for you. Using your gifts. When you use your gifts, it enhances the service of God, amen. The use of your gift enhances the service of God. communion. Amen. Those at home, prepare your communion. I want to thank the deacons and, and the preachers. They they got on their, the deacons got on their uniforms. Amen. That's their first Sunday uniform. They looking just like I'm looking. Amen. I dress up just like them, amen, on the first Sunday. Amen. For those of you that are out, uh, remember, this, this Jesus represents his broken body. It was broken for us. Many places that they broke his body and blood ran from it. He said, I want you to remember this because it's done for you. This is his broken body. This is his shared blood. Don't forget Wednesday morning, Bible study, Saturday morning. I mean, Wednesday morning Bible study, Wednesday, Tuesday night, women Bible study on the Zoom. Get your link so you can get on Zoom with the women Bible study on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock, we do our, our Bible class. Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, we do our Sunday school lesson. This coming Saturday morning will be our district meeting. Amen. We want each one of you to tune in to our district meeting. Get that, get that link and to join in our district meeting. Amen. I'll be teaching on leadership this month. Amen. Leadership. Has everyone been served? Everyone been served? Then let us stand. They sang the hymn and they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Ghost. Rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth now and forever. And the saints of God said, Amen.